Yeah, let's keep it on the show. (laughs) What's up, everybody? We are here game planning as we go live right now. Jensen Cummings, Chef Elon Wenzel is with us from Element Knife Company. Thank you for tuning in as always of this episode of Best Serve Smart, where we're focusing on technology, innovation, smart kitchens, tools, equipment, and we are talking sharpen your knives. Sharpen your knives, cooks. Listen to what we're saying today with Elon Wenzel. As I mentioned, Elon, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. So we were joking about it before we went live, but you and I started the Best Serve podcast with a Facebook Live, which now we do every single day on November 18th of 2019, which seems like five years ago now. It does. (laughs) Believable. So we sat right downstairs and kind of shared the premise of Best Serve Podcast. I interviewed you a little bit. You interviewed me. And away we went. Go up to March you know, 12th, 13th, 14th. We had 37 episodes of the full audio podcast and then pivoted, as people are, are saying now, into the live show. And this is 151. And I could not be more excited to be talking to you. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. A lot has happened since. All right. So... Tell everybody, Element Knife Company, what is that? What can they expect? Clearly knives. We see them behind you. But tell people a little bit about Element Knife Company. So Element Knife Company really has its origins from me befriending a traveling knife salesman. I have a background in sushi. Um, I've been making sushi for uh, 20 years now. I trained sushi in Japan in 2004. And circa 2005, 6, 7, there was this old Japanese guy that would come with a suitcase full of knives unannounced to all of the sushi bars in the Denver metro area. And I would buy something from him every time. And I think I became one of his better customers. And uh, we would have a conversation uh, over the every time he was there over the years. And at one point, I realized he was only going to um, Japanese restaurants. And what was regular or commonplace for me in terms of Japanese cutlery, I started to see make its way into Western restaurants. Uh, it started to you know, show up on TV and some of my chef friends in Denver um, had them. And so I told him, his name is Tetsuya, he goes by Ted. I said, hey, Ted, um, I know a ton of chef friends in Denver that would love to see the knives. How about I just give you their number? You can go make sales and please. Uh, and he asked if I would set up the appointments and make the introductions. And I was kind of thinking like that would be a pain in my butt on my potentially like one day off. But I did it because I, I really liked him and I really liked his products and I considered him a friend. So we went around and he just made a ton of sales and he was so appreciative that unsolicited, he cut me a commission check and I was like, oh, okay, I see the potential here. Ah, and- wait a minute, there's some money in this. I, <laughs> yeah. So I remember those days because I was at the time, I think it might've been the first time I bought a knife from you all was a tag restaurant. Yeah. And I later bought a lot of knives when I was at row 14 yep. uh-huh. and uh, even bought knives for sous chefs and stuff. Like I very much believed in the knives. I spent entirely too much money, but, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was it. worth it. The right tool, right job, kind of that mentality. So uh, uh, take us to today, right? You have a physical space now. Talk about that just real quick. And then I want to take people back to yeah, kind of so, origin. Um, I I had been working towards trying to get like a physical space and I found an opportunity inside the Broadway market Denver where I had done some pop-ups and it turns out one of the stalls had opened up and become available. So um, I had brought in and kind of set up shop the first week of March. I was open for a week and then March 15th, we got hit with all the shutdowns. So went back to sales calls and supporting my peers in the industry the best that I could in just the smallest way of just offering free knife sharpening. Um, but nonetheless, we're back and we're jamming. So it's really great to be here. We offer uh, all the cutlery, tools, accessories, aprons, knife rolls, locally made products. Some I'm curating some high-end pantry goods, um, the Spice Guy, Miso Hot, those types of things. Um, and full line of sharpening services as well. So single bevel, which would be like traditional Japanese style or Western bevel, which kind of like your classic chef's knife that everybody's familiar with. So we sharpen, we fix. Um, Awesome. Yeah. We're gonna get into that, everybody. Uh, This will be the first time ever. We're gonna have some, uh, some action going on during the show where Elon's actually gonna show us just very quickly some technique on knife sharpening. I've been in the game for 20 years I'm still impressed every time I watch Elon sharpen <laughs> knives. We're neighbors, and I literally don't sharpen my own knives. I <laughs> yeah. go over to Elon's to sharpen because they're just 
better, but up your game. It's really, really important. Yeah, if you're investing really. money into yourself, into your equipment and tools, you need to invest in sharpening. Sharp knives is the whole game. We'll get into that a little bit more, but let's take people back before we get there. Let's go back. You mentioned 2004, you, you went to Japan. Further back, when did you first catch the hospitality bug? When did you get into this crazy industry? Oh man, it was high school. Um, junior year of high school, our career counselor wanted to get us uh, on a career path. And I was into art and photography and I was studying black and white photography. And I really was thinking that that's what I was gonna pursue. And the career counselor said something along the lines of, it can be really competitive. I don't suggest that. How about being a chef? Chefs can make up to $100,000 a year and they're really creative. And I don't know where she got those metrics and figures. Yeah, but those are real numbers. <laughs> yeah, of course not. Uh, but it sounded good to me. So I said, sign me up, right? And so she got me involved my senior year running a cafeteria at a vocational school. And uh, I kind of had a knack for it, I suppose, at least at that level. And I liked the dynamics of kitchens, um, at least at this like really beginning type level, like I had said. And so the director of that program signed us up towards the end of the year for something called HERO, Home Economics Related Occupations. And they had competitions uh, and restaurants was part of that hospitality. So she signed me up for a um, front of the house competition and a back of the house. And I took gold for front and silver for back. And that kind of got the bug in me. And she yeah, was, she you, knew you had the game, man. You had some had, validation. Yeah. Um, super interesting. Was it clear to you that that it was an art form? Did it like did it really stimulate the artist in you? No. Um, yeah, understood. I, yeah. I, I, I had a sense that you could be artistic with it, but I, I couldn't apply those ideas in my head yet because I didn't have a palette. I didn't understand flavors and flavor profiles and how things work together. And I didn't understand some of the science behind it on what those changes that happen within food when you do certain things to them. And yeah, so that's I just why I, I asked because yeah, I just didn't have that it's a clear connection for an artist. Sometimes it's such a a, a workman's laborer kind of mentality and grinding yeah. in the kitchen. And when and how you find that, which is now the transition point, knowing that you're very artistic, yeah. you find sushi. And clearly, sushi of any medium of cuisine really is an expression of artistry. And so when did you find that? And was it clear at that moment, now you had found an art form that could like express yourself in yeah, the way you for had sure. Yeah. Um, so in culinary school, I had always kind of gravitated toward uh, garmage uh, and okay. char charcuterie specifically. I really loved um, force meats and all those types of things and presenting platters. And when I fell into sushi in 99, at Wolfgang Puck's, um, and I was actually hired to be a kitchen manager. I showed up for my first day of work and they needed help in the sushi bar and what was supposed to be a temporary thing turned into a full-time deal and I fell in love with sushi. Uh, right. Worked it out with the head sushi chef and the head kitchen chef to just keep me back behind the sushi counter. Um, and it was a great experience, but I realized that it was very artistic and some of the sensibilities within the Japanese culture that I really appreciated, um, like minimalism, and more is less. It really spoke to me and I saw that with like the plating and um, the types of food and the balance of flavors and how simple and clean things can be within sushi, but yet really complex, right? Because there's so much like fermentation, uh, yeah. aging and these types of things um, that go into like the sauces and those types of things. So um, it really, really spoke to me. And so the when you were where you and I met, where you really made your name was at Sushi Sasa in Denver, which how many years you still kind of help them out now full time <laughs> with a knife company. But how many years were you there full time? Working? 13. That is like forever. <laughs> yeah, that's forever like in a restaurant. <laughs> and you had such a strong team there. I think of so many strong sushi chefs. Oh, like, man. You yeah. want to open up other places that are just some of the best names uh, in Denver and beyond. Why were you able to create such a strong team there? Well, I think that we all kind of had a common goal. We understood um, the quality. Uh, we had really strict guidelines in terms of Edomai Zushi, which is the most common form of sushi that most people are familiar with. And it's the most modern incarnation of sushi. Right. Um, so we had to make sure that the sizes of the fish cuts were right and the amounts of rice were right because that really helps with the flavor and the like enjoyment when it hits your uh, palate. 
Um, and just, I think, respect for one another. Um, we kind of had this friendly competition a lot of the time about like making sushi the fastest or prepping the most amount of stuff. Um, and our team was just great. You know, at one point we had um, probably over a hundred years of experience between like the five or six of us. Yeah, I mean, you know, Wayne Conwell, the owner, AG, like those guys had probably 20 years, uh, a few years back or over 20 years. I was coming up on 20 years. We had guys that had 10, 15 years experience. And when you, also the customers, honestly, um, yeah. when the guests love and appreciate food and they basically demand that you have some of the best product, it's good, it's good all around because we're working with some of the better products and that's great for us and we love that. Yes, yeah. demand that you have the best products on both sides of the equation, I think is so, so crucial. And, uh, and that comes from a lot of education. Internally, I know that there was a lot of education that happened there. There was always so much information sharing there. I was always just a sponge. Every time I sat at that counter, we like, what is that fish? What are you guys doing? What's that cut? Like, what's that yeah. knife that you guys have? It's the first time I saw any of those, you know, you guys had thousand dollar knives. I was like, say what? I was like, I have my hankles from school. These cost like a buck fifty. Like, I don't even yeah. understand a thousand dollar knife. That's exactly that's exactly what happened to me when I fell into sushi. I was I, I love knives and I love I was kind of always on the hunt for a bigger, better knife. And when I was going to culinary school and I saw higher level chefs with these like bigger, more expensive, fancy knives, I was always looking for that. When I fell into sushi, it was just a whole nother world of like carbon steel knives and single bevel knives, uh, specific knives, right? Like they have a knife that's just for octopus and one that's just for fugu. And yes. so it, it was fascinating. I fell in love all over again. And yeah, there. Yes. Well, let's look into too. that. Okay. There's a lot to learn. And honestly, somebody who studied in knives still talking to you, it, half the stuff you say is way over my head. So it is absolutely a mission that you have to be all in on to be able to get to the level that you're at. And I think about what you do. It's you don't sell knives. You're really like focused on mastery of, of cutlery and knife work. And the tool is just the right tool at the right time right. for the right job for the right person. All yeah. of these things matter. Let's talk to all the cooks out there. Lots of cooks watch the show. That's what we focus on. You know, our unsung hospitality heroes who are out there and don't understand what they're looking for, what they need. Let's talk to us for a while. Let's wrap for a few minutes about like what they need to be thinking about when they start thinking about their knife roll. Well, you know, I think it's important that you have at least some of the basics. And so a chef's knife is really good because it's general purpose and right. um, it's very versatile. Um, and I find that at a higher level, most chefs have a quiver of knives. So they might have some carbon steel knives, some stainless steel knives, some different alloys within those and some more specific knives. And um, for me, our body, excuse me, body geometrics and like our are different. So my hand, the way it's going to wrap around the blade and the size of my fingers are going to be different than someone else's. That's why I think it's important to pick up a knife and hold it. And it may speak to you whether you realize what those reasons are or not. And then um, it's just a comfort level, right? So some people just gravitate towards a certain brand or a certain style more than others. But that aside, it's the fundamentals that are more important. So care for your tools, like you had mentioned earlier, invest in yourself because this is our chosen profession and we're here. And even if it's not a chosen profession at that period and time point in your life, it's a chosen job. And so you should, in my opinion, um, take ownership of that. And I like to take it to the nth degree as it were. And you and I have talked a lot about the macro and the micro, um, but, but I like to take it to those levels. Um, and it speaks to your character and your work ethic as far as I'm concerned too. So you want to care for your tools and they will in turn help care for you. And it just makes your job more pleasurable, honestly. And this is hard work, right? The restaurant industry is, is not an easy place to be. Um, so if you have the right tools and you have them cared for properly, you won't be struggling and getting frustrated on some low key level throughout the day. And day after day, like if you have a, I just imagining like, and, and it happened to me early on too, right? Like I had knives that were dull and I didn't know how I care for them. And yep. there's kind of this low key, low grade frustration that's happening all the time. And it really kind of takes your energy away from putting all your efforts into your work. 
And so it, it's, we're so kind true. of, yeah, we're moving into a bit of a philosophy here, but I really believe that. I could not agree more. I want to hover on that for a minute. As somebody throughout my career who has hired several thousand people at restaurants, no joke, opening restaurants, hiring 115 people for a new restaurant. I've hired so many people. One of the things that I always did was I gave people a chive test, right? And had them cut chives and there was this whole philosophy behind it. And one of the things I always did was like, I wanted to see your knives. I wanted to touch your knife. I would always see how sharp your knife was. That told me a lot about the care and attention you were gonna take with the ingredients that I gave you with the money that I entrusted into your hands. That's right. If you were willing to spend the time and effort and care and attention to your own equipment yourself, I had more confidence in you and the likelihood of you getting a job was high. So for all the young cooks out there, don't sleep on it. It is really, really important. This is not just a strong piece of metal that's a tool. It is an expression and an extension of you. That's so right. yeah, we're getting very philosophical <laughs> yeah. right now, but you and I can go deep down that rabbit hole. Let's talk about some other styles of knives because like looking just at the knives you have behind you, I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what I need. Like, I don't know the names and terminology of most of these knives. Like, I don't understand what I'm going to need. So, you know, talk to us a little bit about when you're thinking about selection beyond kind of having a pairing knife, having a serrated blade of some type, having the chef's knife. When you get into some more specialty things, give us some knives and what they might do and help grab them off the wall. Let's, let's show people some stuff. Sure. So um, real quick, like you don't necessarily have to know the names. Um, what you need to know are like, I'm here for you and I want to help and educate my peers in the industry and locally as well. And so um, just real quick, a little side note, um, anybody in the Denver metro area that wants to swing into the shop and you're in the restaurant industry or you're a chef and you want to understand the care a little bit better on your knives or maybe how to sharpen them, I'll have you come around the counter. We'll go over some like um, fundamentals on how to sharpen a knife if you want to up your game and you don't know. Um, so nonetheless, um, and, and I want to tell everyone, Elon's serious. Like, oh, yeah. if anything, Elon spends too much time on <laughs> education and not enough on the sell. I always have to <laughs> yeah. like, Elon, remember, you're in business, you need to balance out education and, uh, and revenues, uh, but absolutely go check out the shop you want to know the name of every knife the history of that style of knife the makeup of the forging process of that steel elon will tell you all of it you better yeah. come prepared to take notes so i, I appreciate yeah. that sure. <laughs> for sure yeah and you know in today's market with uh some of the younger generations there's a lot of crossover now so some of the stuff that is specific to sushi here's a here's a customer's knife that uh i'm sharpening for them this is a single bevel knife. I think you can see it here. This side, we have the bevel right here. This side is flat. It's actually yeah. slightly concave, but you can't see so that. So bevel is well. the angle. Bevel is the, the angle, right. This and is the classic flat. knife. This is what uh, you're talking about, where one side is basically flat and the other is angled. Yeah, so this knife, we have the bevel right along here. And then on the other side, we have a matching bevel. So right. if we were to sight down the knife, we're looking at a 50-50 edge angle. And then we can talk about, that's a whole nother conversation about what those specific edge angles are. And you can change those to your knife to accomplish what you want to do and like more specialize it more towards what you are doing. Um, but on the, I'm just going to pick. Yeah, show us around here, over here. So that looks great, by the way. Um, on this top shelf here, we kind of have a lot of the uh, single bevel Japanese specific knives. Something like this would be for sushi. It's called a Yanagi. Um, it's really for like service. So cutting rolls and sashimi and nigiri and those types of things. Uh, and then we get into some of the uh, prep knives. This is a vegetable knife. It's referred to as a kiritsuke, specifically kiritsuke usuba. There are three types of usuba technically. Usuba is a vegetable knife. Yeah. So on the uh, blade profile, uh, it's very straight because the Japanese have this push forward technique where the whole knife is coming off of the cutting board and being pushed forward as opposed to European styles where the tip of the blade is stays on the cutting board and there's a rocking, rocking motion. motion. Yeah. And, and that's why some of the chef's knives um, have a rounded um, uh, blade as it were cutting edge. So you can do that rocking. Um, and then we get into some, so these are kind of like Western style down here where uh, yeah. here is um, 
Tsuchime, it's a hammered texture. It works as an air release. Um, and the Damascus, uh, we have some very basic kind of classic knives, a slicing knife, um, chef's knives, petty knives. Um, Deba, you have one very much like this guy here with the uh, uh, life hand. Yeah, uh, that's really great. And then we start to get into more specialized where these are, uh, they have a core within them and a softer outer jacket. And that Japanese technique of forging is called warikami or sanmai. So what that means is um, you want a hard steel for edge retention and um, to hold that edge. And But hardness means brittleness. And so if the knife is very hard, you have to have some way, whether it's in the um, quenching process or in the forging process, where you give shock absorption and flexibility. And that way you have the best of both worlds. And that's really like where... Damascus, or the idea of Damascus originated from. You have two parent steels that come together and that's where you get that beautiful pattern. But you get the attributes of both of those steels. So softer and harder or Higane and Jigane as the Japanese call it. Good, I wanted to let you geek out and go down that rabbit hole a little bit <laughs> just to set the understanding for people like it's complex. So like everybody is going to have a knife that works for them, what feels right for them, the weight for them, the the products that you're going to be cutting with those, That's right. what you're looking for as far as the amount of work it's going to get, all of those things make a difference. So they do. And the opportunity, it's it's confusing for sure, but you also have an opportunity to find exactly what you're going to need for the job that you have. So I think that's an important thing to recognize. Let's talk cost with people real quick. What should somebody be investing in their knives? Give, it, give us an idea of maybe what some of those knives are, what you kind of recommend is like, I don't have a lot of money because I'm a cook. Like, what do I do? How do I navigate kind of getting started? Because I know I want to invest. I just don't know how, where, when, and how much. Sure, so also kind of a, a, a lot of information there, but, um, you get what you pay for typically with cutlery. And so Good. be wary of anything that you see online that looks beautiful, but chances are it's made in China and the quality might not be there. So at first use or first sight, it's going to feel great or look great, but it's not going to hold up over time. And pricing should be fair too. My pricing is always fair and competitive. Um, you can great get into a great professional level. Actually, all my knives, whether it's the more economical price point at, at the at the lower end or the really high end stuff, um, they're for home chefs, professional chefs, and so I have price points in the hundreds, in the low hundreds, um, that you can use on a professional level, and the knife will last you uh, forever. Um, yeah. And then you can you get take up in care the of it. It will if it if you take care of it. That's right. And so uh, also people ask what the difference between Japanese steel and Western or German steel is, and it's really apples and oranges when you compare the two. You know, I would take my old um, German knife with that big heel on it and I'd open a number 10 can and I wouldn't think twice about it because of the way the alloys are put together and how tough it is, but it's not going to have that refined edge and you wouldn't want to do that with Japanese steel because they'll chip out and they're a little more thin and fragile. And I think people maybe misunderstand that. They think of, I think inherently people think of samurai swords and fighting and clashing blades together when they think Japanese cutlery and that's not the case. They're really something that I wouldn't like hack at a coconut with because your knife will lose. Um, yeah. It's but a finite tool, which doesn't a, mean because it's not as quote unquote strong doesn't mean it's a lesser knife. It's very specific for a certain job, which you need that refined edge versus more of, more of a blunt object. That's exactly right. And the reason I call my business Element Knife Company is, is not only it's tools for chefs who are in their element, but these elements like chromium, mag, uh, magnesium, uh, molybdenum, vanadium, these elements give knives attributes. And so the knife may have better sharpenability, better edge retention or longer lasting, whatever it is. And so uh, flexibility too. So um, it's, you can really zone in on the things that you're looking for and you can have a knife that covers that specifically. Yes. All right. I want to show people you sharpening knives. As I All mentioned, right. like, I think it's an important thing to understand. One of the things that I recognize right away, and you can get into it. I'll talk to people for a second while you get situated. So one of the things that I recognize as somebody who sharpened my knives on stones for years before I saw Elon sharpen a knife is I was way too timid was one of the big things. 
yeah. so that was one of the big takeaways is like you really get in there where like it you can hear that the work is happening was one thing and the other thing that i wasn't very good at that you taught me as well was like count your strokes like be very aware of the number of strokes that you're doing and then the angle those are the three things that i always like try and stick yeah. but uh that's right so yeah, show quick, everybody what's up real quick i have this uh new to market sharpening system from nano home and you can find them here at element knife company i believe i'm the only one in colorado that has them Ooh, nice um, plug. good work man yeah so it has this really nice base system and the bottom of the plates which are machined aluminum they won't bend they won't flex um, they fit right into the base and they lock into place. And so we have all the different um, grits and whatnot. So um, what's great is it's not going to slide around on you. And these are a splash and go. Some of the ceramic water stones, which I always recommend over oil stones, um, it's best bang for your buck. And there's like less cleanup and you don't have, you know, if you run out of the honing oil, you're not screwed. Um, all, yeah. you need is, all you need to do is splash on some water. And a lot of people might recognize the base of your sharpening setup there from their backyard. because that's Yeah, weird. that's right. And so th what I have going on here is I – so this system, just to go back for a second, this system offers an array of different um, lapping plates, which are stone fixers. Um, and it's just as we talk about how important it is to fix your uh, – have your knife sharpened properly and work – uh, think about those angles you want to um, care for your stone and so when you use your stone you start to get a divot over time because uh, the knife is not only is the stone cutting into the blade but the metal is wearing away some of the surface of the stone and if you don't have a flat stone you're really going to get what I call a false edge so you want to be able to lap your stone and get, keep it flat but if you don't want to invest in a lapping plate find a sidewalk or a, this was like a couple bucks at Lowe's. Um, yeah. Steal just a, a tile from your backyard. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. You can fix your, you can fix your uh, stone on one of these. So as long as there aren't like pebbles or anything sticking out of it, that will gouge out your, your stone. So it's anyhow. Yeah, like why hack? I love it. Uh, yeah, uh, it's really great. And I'm, I'd love to make the sale, but also I'm here to support and educate. So if you can save yourself a couple bucks until you have that money, you can still care for your tools properly. So some of the fundamentals that we think about when we um, are sharpening is we want to use the whole surface. We don't want to just use one area. Typically, people use the center. So try to go over the entire face of the stone, and that will help you not use up so much and then have to fix it more later. So you're really lengthening the life of your sharpening stone. Also, another important fundamental is pressure. This is not a white knuckle event, so don't press super hard. Let the stone cut into the metal and establish that bevel, that cutting edge. So let it do the work. And once again, the amount of strokes that you do. Also, just go slowly because what we don't want to do is the angle of the knife that we're holding it off of the stone as we go forward we want to keep that angle all the way through right on both sides whatever our chosen angle is so if we were to lift up it's going to change that uh edge angle so it could be wider or narrower and it's going to really mess with how sharp your knife is or don't be laying it flat so it just takes practice. So I tell people, take an old knife you don't care about or find one at um, a thrift store for a couple of bucks, get a sharpening stone, and it's just man hours, right? Just invest a few minutes after work um, regularly. It doesn't have to be every night and practice. And then you're going to just, just like with anything, with those man hours and that exposure to it, you're going to get better to where eventually you can be doing it at a higher rate. And then just it's a few minutes after work to hone up all your edges. If you really let it go, there are tricks to uh, bringing them back quicker. But typically, you just want to go a few times over. I love and, it. Yeah, you want to check your work, right? I mean, there are people that do paper tests and, and that type of thing. I have some tricks that I use. I don't worry about the paper test. Um, but I think what, I what's one trick? We'll, we'll wrap up with this. What's one trick to uh, know that your knife is actually sharp? 
So you can feel with the pads of your thumbs. Just press lightly. Don't slide. Here, show, or, show, me, show us up a little bit. Here we go. Yeah. There you go. So you can do that. You can get a sense if it's biting into your uh, flesh a little bit. Or on your fingernail, just don't pull and don't press, but just light little strokes. And if it bites in, and uh, then it's sharp. But if it slides, it's dull. Yeah. So you, you can off your thumb. Do yeah. You <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can determine where on your blade you might have a spot that needs work. Yes. I think that's the key thing. I've noticed that for myself where I might test an area, but it's also the area that I was putting the most pressure on and another part of my blade was very dull. So I think that's, that's right. a good point. Even pressure all the way across. I love it. Absolutely. All right. Broadway Market. Tell people where exactly they can uh, find you if they're not familiar with Broadway Market. I want to get people down there to support what's happening down at Broadway Market and you and get down there learn how to sharpen knives check out knives get some education yeah. they're down there yeah 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 for sure so the broadway market is at 950 north broadway so it's right between 9th and 10th on broadway and uh we had just reopened after the the closures we were open for takeout and delivery for a time but now that we're open to the public um we will be closed on sundays and mondays as we move into this okay. but outside of that you can find us we open at 7 30 and we're open until uh, uh maybe 10 at night um, and then my knife shop has some limited hours within that, but I start at 10 in the morning, uh, and I'll be here all day, the, uh, during those hours outside of Fridays and Saturdays when I leave at four. Uh, but yeah, we got a ton of great food. We have coffee, we have alcohol. Uh, we got a fun photo booth and actually element knife company now has a vending machine. So you can get some oh, yeah. of the, <laughs> you can get some of the tchotchkes, uh, and goodies, and it's going to be a mystery row and all kinds of fun stuff. So. Get your, get your uh, plating tongs and tweezers and spoons yeah. and all of that. Uh, really appreciate it. Get down there. Look, every single cook who's watching this, every single bartender who's watching this, you have knives. Invest in them. Understand that this tool is an extension of your work, the quality of your work, the integrity of your work, as well as just you, you mentioned the low-grade frustration that can set in. It absolutely can put you on tilt if your equipment is not up to par and it is your responsibility to make sure that it's such. So I really appreciate that. Well put. Dylan, thank you so much for being thank on. You. Thanks for uh, all the education you've given me over the years and thanks for helping start this crazy podcast. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Yeah, man. We, we love it. Thanks for what you're doing for our uh, community and our peers in the industry. All right. You have a great day. Sell some thanks. knives today and educate. Thanks, man. All right. See you guys later. Right. Bye. Good. Cheers. All right, everybody. Best served, BSP, best served podcast 151. Sharpen your knives with Elon Wenzel of Element Knife Company. Amazing, good, good friend, and just one of the best. If you've come across Elon, you just know he just gives a shit about the industry and the people in the industry 100%. He's talking about different products and goods that he's promoting and selling. These are local artisans as well, local producers as well. It really means a lot to him, I know. So, you know, I am unabashedly co-signing everything the guy does. Full stop. The end. Go check it out. And uh, and I love this channel. I'm excited that we get to get a little bit more practical. Best served smart, right? We're going to talk about technology. So it could be, you know, hiring apps or contactless dining or you know, APIs attaching onto websites, anything on that front, as well as just anything on the innovation side when it comes to tools, equipment, things like that. It's going to be important that we just kind of understand the resources, tools that we have at our disposal in the industry. That is it for today. Thank you so much, as always, for watching. I really appreciate you. Cheers.